and the crowd goes wild, huh? All four of you. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm personally getting used to it. I like it. I go out, there's nobody out, you know? And uh, I'm, on, I'm on the road, and there's nobody on the road, and I go into a store, and there's nobody in the store. I'm, I'm kind of getting used to it. I really am. I kind of like it. Yeah. Um, oh, how you doing? Shabbat Shalom, right? You're sitting there. I have to be honest with you, and this is no, this is, this, this has, this has, n- I wish I wasn't so honest. Um, last week I sat and watched, and I got to tell you, sitting at home on a couch and doing online services, you guys should just be so thankful that you have a congregation to go to. I mean, I just hope, I pray. I'm telling you, God is my witness, and so are you. If we come back and I see people unappreciated, I'm just going to go online. I am. I promise. I promise. One time a worship band, I think it was, uh, what's his name? The Heart of Worship. Who's that guy? From England. What's his name? Matt Redman. Matt Redman Redman once, he felt that people were just not worshiping. So he stopped worship for a year. The church didn't worship for a whole year. And when they came back, they worshiped. I'll do the same thing. I can do that. If I ask the elders, if I ask the elders, I'm sure they'll go along with it. Yep, see, I already got one vote. So guess what, Dave, if you're watching, you've been outvoted just now. Just now. I'll do it because, because you guys really don't appreciate what you have. You don't. I was home sitting and I was thinking, if I had to do this every week, and we have so many online people that have to do it because they don't have a place in their, in their proximity to go to. A lot of places out there are just, they're so unbalanced. And you come in here and you see all these people smiling and happy and hugging and your kids are running in the playground with the other kids and they're in Shabbat school while you're here worshiping. Somebody else is taking care of your kids and taking care of your kids well. Not just making sure they're safe, but teaching them. Sometimes better than we do at home. You've got to appreciate. You must appreciate. Look. Guys, I know there's a lot of people out there, maybe some of you, what's the perfect will for me? What's the perfect will for me? Stop. God doesn't work like that. He doesn't micromanage like we do. He doesn't micromanage. He doesn't say you have to live here. He might tell you to move somewhere. He might. But he doesn't micromanage. There's three things for you to take care of, okay? Three things in the will of God for you in the Bible. One, to be holy. There's no question about that. It is God's will for you to be sanctified. It says so in the Bible. God's will for you to be sanctified. The second thing is it's God's will for you to do good works, 1 Peter 2.15. It's God's will for you to do good works. Your, your being born again should not just, your, your life should not just be pro-life and pro-heterosexual uh, marriage. If that's all you got going for yourself and you're not drinking, wow, you're going to really impress the Lord when you sit before him. Good works, good works, works of righteousness, works of righteousness. And the third one that's so overlooked is it's the will of God. It says so in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. It's the will of God, it's the will of God for you to be thankful in all circumstances. Not thankful for the circumstance. Oh, thank you that I had a car accident. Thank you in the circumstance, meaning believing that God either promoted it or permitted it and some good will come out of it. So that's what I'm talking about, appreciation, being thankful, being thankful. Your mind can't be thankful and miserable at the same time. It's not possible. Your brain can't work like that. So I know, I know, I I think people take it for granted. I'll tell you another thing. I read a story about a guy who had a mega church. He walked away from it. And you know why he walked away? And I'm going (laughs) to, he walked away because he watched people come every week the same. No change. They came, they heard a message, good message, good music, and they came back 162 hours later, the same. Can you imagine that? For a man of God to work so hard and see thousands of people coming back unchanged? And he said, I'm done. I'm done. And I, I kind of know exactly how we feel, so I hope that Beth Yeshua is in that kind of a place. And just when I thought that, just when I thought that, um, this week, I said, I said to Bernard, I go, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. If people come back the same, what's the point? 
what's the point? What's even the point of your faith? So um, I was feeling kind of lousy about myself and feeling that I was wasting my time. And I just went to the park to walk and some obscure woman just ran into me and said she watches online. You know, she doesn't go to church anymore. I, I can understand sometimes. And she just told me how it's changed her life. But I'm telling you guys, I could care less. I'll never walk away from God, but I could walk away from this in a heartbeat. No problem. And I'm not threatening you. I'm just saying so, this has to change you. It has to change you. It has to humble you. It has to make you more compassionate. Uh, it has to make you more, more of a servant. There has to be some change. You know, you could change your hair. You could change your, your car you drive. You could change where you live. You could change your job. But only God could change your heart. And you've got to be open to the change. You've got to be willing to change. This is what it's all about. The Lord, I don't care what denomination, I could care less about your little theology about faith. I could care less. God, the whole point was he would take a mess, a mess. And if you think you're not a mess, you are so messed. And you know what the beautiful thing is? Even in the midst of our mess, God still loves us because we're his mess. Just like if you got a kid who's messed up, you don't ever stop loving them. Sometimes you even love them more because you feel so bad that they're so messed up. But it's God's job, it's his job to unmess the mess and make us more like Yeshua. We've got to be moving in that direction. Yes, we still mess up. I get it. I'm with you. I get it. I'm not talking about perfection. I'm not talking about you listening to me right now and beating yourself up, feeling guilty. I'm not talking about that. But are you even willing to change? Do you even start your day with, Lord, conform me, change me into more of the image of Messiah? Or is that just, is your day autopilot? Is your week autopilot? Does it go from one day to the next, one day to the next, routine, get up, coffee, work, come home, da -da, and one day to the next, and you, you aren't even conscious of changing. It just doesn't happen on its own. You can't get in physical shape just by, by, by just, it, it just doesn't happen. You've got to do something. You've got to do something. There's a human side to this thing, this equation. God's more than willing. I'm not talking about beating yourself up again. That's too easy. I could beat you up so easily. You could beat yourself up. You could beat me up. It's so easy. All we've got to do is present your shoe and we all feel bad. We don't measure up. It's okay. God, God, God saved us when we were a total mess. A total mess, an obliterated mess of a mess. He's just, are you in the game? Are you even in the game? Or are you just coasting? Are you just like, well, I'll just coast. You know what? I hate to coast. I rode bikes. I did bicycle races. I did competitive triathlons. I hated to coast. I hated to coast. And I can't stand still water. Don't bring me to a lake. I want waves. I want waves. I want to move. And I'm sure you do too. So with that being said, Shabbat Shalom. Let me read a psalm. This is probably the most penitential psalm in the whole book of Psalms. I'm reading from Psalm 51. If you have your Bibles, you can open them up at home and read along because um, the written word is very powerful. Hearing audibly is not as good as, as hearing and, you know, you get two things involved, right? You got five senses. If, if you get your hearing involved and your vision involved, it's exponential, okay? That's why sometimes you're sitting there and I'm speaking, but you're not really hearing it. You're really not. So take out your Bibles at home and uh, enjoy the Word of God. One day they might take it from us. God in your grace, have mercy on me. In your great compassion, blot out my crimes. This is um, obviously when David was approached by the prophet Nathan about his uh, sexual interlude with uh, Bathsheba and the awful thing he did with Uriah, her husband. So verse 1, we're talking about just, it's an awful violation of God's holy law. David cries out, he says, wash me completely. Wash me completely from my guilt. Guilt is the killer. Guilt is the 
Guilt is the, guilt is the problem. And cleanse me from my sin. So he's, he's pleading for God for, for cleansing from the sin and, and that his heart and mind should be, should be free from its guilt. He says, for I know my crimes. He's, he's, taking, he's taking responsibility, something which in our society is, nobody takes responsibility. It's my boss's fault. It's, 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 it's it, it, I mean, you know, it's everybody else's fault except mine. David says, and this is 3,000 years old and it's timeless. 3,000 years old. 3,000 years old. Timeless. For I know my crimes, my sin confronts me all the time. So, First, he's saying the sin is all mine. It's all my fault. God, it's not your fault. It's not anybody else's fault. It's my fault. My fault. Okay? When you sin, it's your fault. Don't say the devil made me do it. The devil can't make you do anything. Hear me. The devil can't make you do anything. No, he can't. He can tempt you, but he can't make you. No. No. Flip Wilson was wrong. The devil didn't make him do it. And then he says, it confronts me all the time. It's haunting me. It's haunting me. This sin was haunting him. He couldn't get any sleep. He couldn't get any rest. He was miserable. This guy was a king. He had a harem. He was a multi-gazillionaire. And he was miserable. Miserable. Then he says, against you, and you only have I sinned, and done what is evil from your perspective. Okay? I have broken your law. Your name has been dishonored. So that you are right in accusing me. God, you are right. I am wrong and justified in passing sentence. Then he says, true, I was born guilty, was a sinner from the moment my mother conceived me. First of all, we see that life starts at conception. I don't want to get into a whole pro-life thing, but don't think that just because you can't see the baby on the outside, there's not a baby on the inside. Okay? It's living. It's life. So he's talking about sin nature. He's talking about the sin nature 3,000 years ago. We know we're born into sin. We have, we have sinful spiritual genetics. Still, you want truth in the inner person, so you make me know wisdom in my inmost heart. Praise the Lord. Nobody is with an excuse. Then he says, sprinkle me with this up, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Very interesting. If you, if you, if you know the Bible well, you would know that isop and water were used to cleanse a leper. Look at Leviticus 14, 1 through 8, and you'll find out. Isop and water was used to cleanse the leper. Why is he saying this? Because we're all moral lepers. We're all diseased with our sin nature. He said, let me hear the sound of joy and gladness so that my bones you crush can rejoice. Make no mistake, God's doing the crushing. Turn away your face from my sins and blot out my crimes. He's saying, you know, when I sinned, I lost my song. I lost my song. I'm not singing. Create in me a clean heart, God. Renew in me a resolute spirit. He's talking about the heart because if the fountain is polluted, then the stream is polluted. Don't thrust me away from your presence. Don't take your Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit, away from me. He, he is on his face, and he's saying, you're right. Your judgment that you pass, whatever it is, I accept. I'm not trying to get away from it. I'm not trying to get some slick attorney. I'm not trying to plead a deal. Whatever it is, I'm just asking one thing. Don't take your presence from me. I, I can't deal with life if you're not in it. The thought of being separated from David is killing him more than the sin is. Then he begs, restore my joy. He's miserable. In your salvation, restore my, deliver me, and I'll be happy again, and let a willing spirit uphold me. Then I will teach the wicked your ways, and sinners will return to you. He'll witness, he'll witness, he'll witness about God's pardon and God's peace. You want to know how to witness? Witness about God's pardon and God's peace. But if you don't have God's peace, how are you going to witness it? Rescue me from the guilt of shedding blood. He did. He killed Uriah, make no mistake. God, God of my salvation, my deliverer, then my tongue will sing about your righteousness. I don't know, I open my lips. It's like his lips have been sealed by sin. Can't even talk about God. Then my mouth will praise you. 
for you don't want sacrifices or I would give them to you. How many, how many animals do you think he had access to? Tens of thousands he could have sacrificed. Tens of thousands. You don't take pleasure in burnt offerings. Why? Because it's external. It's ritual. God wants something internal and relational. He doesn't want ritual. He wants reality. He wants a relationship. So my sacrifice to God, he says, 3,000 years is a broken spirit. I'm broken. God, you, you won't chasten my broken heart, will you? He says, in your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Now you see the selflessness of David. What is he saying? In your good, where does this, out of nowhere, in your good pleasure, make Zion prosper, rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. You know what he's saying? He's saying to God, don't let my sin hinder your progress of your work. Don't let my sin hurt the people. He's a king. Don't let it filter down. Your sin affects everybody. It affects the universe. It affects your family. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices. Once we have confessed, once we have turned, once we are pardoned, then we can worship the God of all grace and mercy. Then you will rejoice in righteous sacrifices, in burnt offerings, in whole burnt offerings. Then they will offer bulls on your altar. He's saying the offerings that he's speaking about talks about dedication. He's saying that now I'm cleansed, now I can rededicate myself to you, Lord. We can start over, and this will gladden your heart. This is what God wants. He wants to have a relationship with us. Why do people have children? Hopefully, and this isn't the reason why a lot of people have children, and it's sad, but hopefully two people love each other, and they want to produce something that represents their love. That's a piece of each of them. Bernard, that's not a piece of me. She's her own self. I'm not a piece of her. I'm, I know we're supposed to walk together, become one. Yes, but in our children, we're one. And that love's supposed to overflow. That's why we love our children so very much. We see them when we love them so very much. And when they do something awful, they can get us so upset because we love them so much. We're so tied into them. This is what God wants. He, he, he made us because he loves us. And he wants a relationship with us. And when we're apart from him, he misses us. Just like the prodigal. The prodigal is all about the father, not about the son. It's all about the father missing the son. It's all about the father not being right without the son. That was a story told about God. And I'm telling you, if there are any prodigals, father, in Yeshua's name, I ask you to, to encounter them with the cross today. Father, to let them see the cross. Let them see what their sin has done. Not just a way like the church teaches. The cross means I'm, I'm going to heaven. The cross means I'm going to heaven. No, the cross means that our sin mutilates people and mutilates ourselves. Father, let them have an encounter with the cross today. And let them repent and come back to you. And Father, I'm asking you like you only you can do. Let them feel your forgiveness. Let them feel your love. Let them feel the restored joy of the relationship that you so desperately want with them. I ask that in Yeshua's name. Amen. Shabbat shalom, guys.